name is Caroline Stanley Young and I'm from Friends of Merlin Woods. I'm here with Emma Roberts from the Galway Red Squirrel Project. And we're just going to find out a bit about the background and how the Galway Red Squirrel Project began. Okay. Could you let us know about that? Absolutely, Thanks. yes. So um, I'm doing my research masters over in NUIG and the title of my masters is The Role of Ecological Corridors and Habitat Fragmentation in the Dispersal of Small Mammals Through an Urban Environment. So in order to do this, we're using a number of methods. So non-invasive monitoring is one, and a really, really huge component of the data that we get in is from citizen science surveys. So um, Merlin Woods is, has a really, really established population of red squirrels. And so the Galway Squirrel Project started to get more information about this population and other populations, such as the population out in Menlo, which is looking like it's, it's quite established as well. And using the reports that we got from our citizen science survey, um, we are finding out a lot more about the squirrels or the individuals that are using ecological corridors throughout the city, such as Terryland Forest Park and Dangan. Um, and how these animals are using these ecological corridors to move throughout the cities, not to necessarily establish in these areas, but to use them as a means of transporting themselves through it. So um, that is how it began. Brilliant, fantastic. Yeah, I'm going to set up one of my hair tubes in here. Take one out and show you what we're working with. So this is a hair tube. There's a lot of different components. So it's just really a piece of PVC piping um, with metal clips on the top to help slide these in. So here we have a wooden block with sticky substances on the two corners and then down here on the bottom. And the idea is that when I take these off and set up the tube, and the animal will pass through to collect the bait and when it does it'll leave a few hairs behind on the sticky pads and whichever animal has passed through I can then detect which one it is um, using t rings method looking at the hairs under a microscope and looking at the cuticles um, left by a gelatin cast so that's what we're going to do so we're going to I'm going to set this up now just all I need to do everything is pretty much ready to go is take off these that I've kept help it stay sticky, slide it back onto the tube and then tie it up very tight and then in around a week or so or maybe two weeks I can I'll come back and collect it. So make sure you take all of your litter with you. going to tie it up here. You want a kind of flat surface so the bait won't fall out. Tuck in the twine there, so it's not, hanging there. It's not too obvious. Yeah. And then we can add the bait on top. So and for the main prize, we put the hazelnuts inside, so you should put three in to encourage them to go in. And then to help them find it, put kind of peanuts in a nice bright colour on top of it. And scattered around as well. And that's one setup. Great. We're going to do that around 15-20 times depending on the area. Um, 
So in Maryland, we usually set up 20. Um, but today I'm going to do 10 in Merlin and 10 in Unclean and Unclean Woods to get an insight into the ecological corridors that the squirrels are potentially passing through. So, that's that. So, as I was saying, this area is extremely valuable because while over there we have a lot of deciduous trees like hazel and a lot of other native species, here we have um, a really old conifer plantation which is um, really really valuable because you have an awful lot of regrowth so while a lot of them would have fallen there's a lot of regrowth a lot of shrubs around even here we have holly um, and these areas are extremely important for native species uh, particularly squirrels as they can only really make use of conifer trees at particular ages so they can't make use of young plantations so you kind of a lot of time has to be invested to grow them to the point where they can actually sustain a population like these trees here. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to talk about uh, feeding signs and how you can detect red squirrels in your area. So in a conifer woodland, like so, um, we have cones here at different levels of consumption. So here is a full cone. As you can see, nothing's been taken off it, nothing's been eaten. Here is a cone that's been nibbled on slightly. So as you can see, the cone has been peeled back and the seeds in the inside there have been eaten and then when they're finished with it they usually look like this so as you can see all the cone has been peeled off and all the seeds from inside have been eaten and in other kinds of areas uh, such as hazel woodlands another good these specimens from earlier thank you Caroline so for hazels you can see when you have a full hazel, you actually have a full hazel. Different animals eat them in different ways. So here's a full hazel. When a squirrel ingests the hazel, it uses its incisors on the top and the bottom to perfectly break it in half like so. Whereas if you have a bird eating your hazels, it's going to be more smashed open, there won't really be any rhyme or reason to it. And then if you have a small rodent, such as a wood mouse, there'll be a little hole bore in the top, and that's how they get at the, the food inside. So here's perfect, uh, perfect example, <laughs> just dropped it, <laughs> of a hazel that has been eaten by a red squirrel. There you go. So we're here in Anchin and Unclean's which is also part of Merlin Woods. And we've been following Emma around this afternoon with her setting up the hair tubes. And so we'd also like to maybe focus in on habitats and the fragmentation of habitats. Mm, for sure. Um, so as Caroline was saying, Unclean and Unclean is also part of Merlin Woods, but it is separated by the extremely busy Dublin Road. Um, so because of that, you have Unclean and Unclean and Merlin which is kind of fragmented in itself. Um, so you have a kind of cluster of habitat fragments, but mainly the main ecological barrier would be the Dublin Road. Um, so here would maybe have originally been a big population of red squirrels that was then halved when they can lead to a lot of problems because if the animals can't travel to and from the population, the original population, it means that you might end up with a lot of isolated populations. So say, for argument's sake, if they couldn't cross over the road, you'd have an isolated population of red squirrels in Anklean and Unclean and an isolated population of red squirrels in Merlin Park around the hospital grounds. So by looking at the presence and absence of Anklean and Unclean woods, we can compare it to the presence and absence of Merlin woods. And um, also with the citizen science uh, reports that I was talking about earlier, we could also see if there's you know, roadkill sightings, if there's um, sightings, say, on the outskirts, we can kind of get a little indicator as to whether or not it's feasible for the animals to cross over um, the ecological barrier that is the old Dublin Road. Yeah. And um, although you can argue that red squirrels can travel from point A to point B, it's just an ecological corridor you think of, say, like a forest park or a hedgerow, 
but it might not necessarily be that an ecological corridor could just be an area where an animal can travel through. Yeah. So they could travel through the road, it's just much more dangerous for them. Um, but hopefully an ideal scenario would be a population, population in Merlin and a population here where they can travel to and between so there's no genetic isolation. Brilliant. Because if there's genetic isolation, they have a very small gene pool with which the animals are breeding between and it can lead to inbreeding and just a loss of overall fitness um, for the animals. So the more, the larger the genetic pool, the better it is for yeah. the population in both Merlin and in Antigua and Kings. Yeah. And I presume then as well, you know, with the urbanisation, say, that's going on, mm -hmm. housing, you know, we've got housing development over here, that all of this will have an impact because we're taking away green areas which were used for wildlife Absolutely. you know so not just for the red squirrels but for every time every, single every time we take away some old green green land or scrub land mm -hmm. that we're removing um, those corridors absolutely so if these ecological corridors are removed you're making it more difficult for animals now we're looking at red squirrels today so but you can also look at say smaller mammals they might need less of an e ecological corridor but for larger mammals and even if you want to go larger again with like say badgers or foxes it's so important for them to have areas where they can travel through to prevent this genetic isolation so um, if people if you take away any of these green areas you're taking away not only habitat if they're residing in the area but also areas for them to travel through yes. and um, although you know infrastructure is going to happen it's if you could if you can try to do it in a way where everywhere is connected, yes, yes. that is kind of the key. To That's good planning, it is isn't good it? You planning. know, to, to keep the green areas linked. For sure. And of course, we can continue with the house building and, the, as you say, good zoning as well. For know, sure. As well. And just every, it might seem like a small area for humans, but for an animal, that a whole population do you know yeah and sometimes even say with housing developments they will you know we might have area of scrub you know mm -hmm. scrub is always seen as something that's not vital but we know scrub is maybe black thorns hazel you know and these are all native food plants for some for sure and if we can kind of convince our planners to look at those as more um, as vital as part of our corridors that would be a good thing as well wouldn't it absolutely and even having connecting if you had the more people that are on board with this the better because say you have a line of buildings or houses and everyone is on board with preserving ecological corridors if there is a row of hedgerows that's an entire corridor and it might seem like something small but it has a huge impact yes um and that's why these areas are so important every okay. single bit of them really We're back here now two weeks later to collect the samples and I'm just going to take down this hair tube but first I'm just going to have a quick look to see if there's any visible hairs from the squirrels and I've dropped it so I'll pick that up. <laughs> so yeah there are a few hairs on this it's usually you get kind of a big clump especially at winter because their winter coats are much bushier but um, we do have a few hairs now I'll see if you guys can see it on the camera. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these home and create gelatin casts of them so I can confirm which species has left these hairs behind. So when you make a gelatin cast um, and you peel the hair away, you're examining the cuticles of the hair that's left behind in the cast. So the pattern left by the cuticles of hair will determine which species has left the hair behind. So that's that for the way. And we'll take down the hair tube now. I don't know why I wear nail varnish when <laughs> I do this job. <laughs> now, uh, this is a hair tube that we have set up in a different part of the woods. And um, this area is great. It's very, very dense and it's a great area for squirrels. Um, so, just one thing about the hair tubes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, these wooden blocks are fitted into the top and the reason for this is to um, ensure that we are only collecting 
hair from mammals such as squirrels because the block fitted in to the square shape of the hair tube makes it so that the squirrel really has to squeeze into it whereas if say a, a mouse or a bank vole was going through um, they could just kind of sneak in under the bottom without having to leave hair um, but you can also kind of tell um, I can't confirm because I haven't done any hair analysis but um, you can kind of tell by the color and the length w it, whether or not it's a squirrel um, so we have a good example here it's a little bit wet so we have to get the hair dryer out um, of really good chunk of squirrel hair that's been left behind it's just there on the bottom as you can see so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a bit of baking paper on the top so to protect the sample and then pack it away and we can confirm them later when we have um, when we make the gelatin cast whether or not it is a squirrel or not and if I'm right or wrong. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks a million Emma that was really interesting we were delighted to see you setting up the hair tubes and then coming back and collecting them and seeing the hair samples that had come out so we're looking forward to seeing what results you can find. Absolutely yes um, I'd love to do we could, we could do a follow-up video maybe um, and we could go through uh, the hair tube results and I can show you how I can determine which species has left the hair behind. So uh, that would be great. So look forward to working with you again Brilliant. in the future. <laughs> and best of luck with the Galway Squirrel Project thank and you. people can check it out yes. on Facebook as well. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.